Well, it's good to see you again. My wife and I just got back from a, a very difficult um, week in Hawaii. Um, it, was, it was honestly a gift from God. It was made possible from, um, by some very dear friends of ours. And it was, it was a full week. It was full of tropical adventures. And if, if you've seen pictures, how many of you have been to Hawaii? If you've never been before, you've got to get over there, anyhow, any way. I'm sure there's some, um, well, don't do anything illegal, but the, the, the pictures just don't do it justice. We had an opportunity to paddleboard. I paddleboarded across open ocean all the way to a remote um, island, small island. Uh, we jet skied up the, the coast. Um, we, we traveled to a sandbar, which is in the middle of the ocean, but it's, it's this, this beach that exists in the middle of the ocean. So you have ocean all around you and, and then just beach. And uh, it, it's, it's, an amazing, it's an amazing experience. Um, one thing I learned about my wife, um, there are uh, these blue floating balls of air with long strings that come off of them. They're known as men of war. And you can tell by their name that they are hostile in every sense. And uh, I got stung by one of them uh, on my ankle one day. And the following day, I was very careful. I, I, when we were swimming out in the ocean, I was very attentive to where these things were located. And my wife and I swam for a couple hours, and then we decided that, hey, I've made it this far, let's head in. And as I was heading in, this huge wave came over me and dropped one right around my neck and right around my, my arm. And... Uh, my wife looks at me, and I can tell that she's processing what to do next, because she can either reach out and pull it off of me and get stung herself, or she can swim away. So she swam away. And, and then finally I went un and under, and it came off, and, and it, it, it's, it's not bad. Steve said, quit your crying. So it, it's... it's um, but then you, you realize, hey, you're in Hawaii, so everything's okay. But a funny thing happened while I was there. One of the evenings I was laying in bed with my wife, and we were falling asleep, and I asked the Lord, why? Why, why would you give me an opportunity like this? Why would you provide a week like this for my wife and I to become refreshed and restored? And he said, and again, I haven't heard the Lord audibly probably more than twice or three times in my life. The first time was when he was calling me back home, when he was calling me really to, to, to salvation, when I had destroyed everything that meant anything to me in my life because of my sin, and I was weeping in my car, and he said, Dan, I still love you. And I gave my life to him at that moment. And then while we were in Hawaii, I was laying in bed and it was quiet. And I said, why, Lord, why have you done this for me? And he said, because I love you. And I know for a fact, there are individuals here today that you are not letting the Lord love you. He desires for you to let go of your life and find him, but you're not willing to lose it because you think this world has something to offer you that God cannot. And that's foolish. That is absolutely foolish. While I was packing to come home, another funny thing happened. I realized I was incredibly excited to leave paradise and come back to Phoenix. I'm serious. And I realized that I love Phoenix. And you guys might find that amusing, but I love Phoenix. You know why? Because you guys are here. Because my kids are here. My family's here. God has called me here. God is doing a work here. We talked to the 
the worship slide team and ask them to use photos of Phoenix, Arizona. A lot of times we have oceans and, and forests and things that create a longing to be someplace else. But if you live here, God has called you to Phoenix, Arizona for a purpose. And I'm excited about that purpose. I'm excited to be a part of Calvary Central right now because God is doing some incredible things in our midst and I know that he wants to continue to do amazing things as we reach out to the lost outside of these walls. He wants to use us as a body to reach the lost. You know, we live in a time right now where words and phrases, phrases are, are losing their meaning. The word Christian, what does that even mean anymore? I think it's been watered down to simply someone who believes in the existence of Jesus Christ. That at one time there was a man who died, maybe even he rose again. But Christian means a follower of Christ. A disciple of Jesus, one who sits under Jesus' tutelage, who sits under his direction. Not someone who lives perfectly, but they're doing their best to follow Jesus wherever he goes. Scripture says we cannot serve two masters. We cannot. And this world lives between the, the world and in Jesus, one foot in the world, one foot that they think is in a relationship with Christ. If we love the world, we do not love God. We need to clearly understand that. If you desire to follow me, you must what? Fulfill your desires daily? Deny yourself daily. Pick up your cross and follow me. I don't think Jesus stuttered. We cannot love our life, serve ourselves, seek our own gain, and also follow Christ. It's not possible. Worship. What does worship mean? Is worship a, collections, a collection of songs that give us a fuzzy feeling before the, the message? that kind of get us a little bit emotional so that our heart is prepared for the mes message? Is worship something that we put on, on on our car radio when we feel kind of depressed and we need a little a pick-me-up? If you look at Pandora or any of the music streaming services, it's not called Christian music, it's called inspirational music because we need to be inspired. It's like a coach giving a pep talk. And I'm not saying worship music can't get us back to a place where we're focused on what's important, but what's the true meaning of worship? Worship is a life that's continually submitted and surrendered to Jesus Christ. It's not a song. It's not a feeling. It's a life surrendered. Romans 12.1, Paul writes, I appeal to you, I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. That's the only thing we can give God. Really, what can we give God ourselves? It's all we have. All we have to give him this morning is ourselves. Lord, do what you will in me and through me. I appeal to you, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and accept, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. If we've spent our entire week saying no, 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 no to God, and then we come here this morning singing praises to him, I'm sorry, that's not an act of worship. Blessing and cursing do not come from the same mouth. That time of worship is an overflow of our submission to Christ during the week. And then church. What does church mean? For most, it's that place, that building that they go maybe once, twice a year. Maybe once a month. Maybe once every Sunday. Maybe Sunday and Wednesday. But that is not church. Church is the body of Jesus Christ. 
We're not called to go to church. We're called to be the church. The bride of Jesus Christ, a collection of saved sinners who live for and through Jesus. 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist. Why do you exist this morning? Why are we breathing? Why do we have life? Why do we have energy? Why do we have the ability to reason? Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, there is one God, the Father, for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we exist. We exist for Christ, and we exist through him. And that's why I was excited to come home, because I see this at Calvary Central. But I also see God pushing us outside these walls to reach out to the lost. Guys, we have a very unique opportunity because of where God has us, because of our location. See, Paul, in these, the, looking back at Sunday, where was Paul? He was in Athens. Athens wasn't one of the biggest cities in the Roman Empire, but they were one of the most educated by worldly standards. They had one of the, the, the most well-known educational institutes in all of Rome. About 10,000 people lived in Athens. And now today we're going to look at Paul, and he's going to travel to Corinth and Ephesus. These are three of the most major cities in the Roman Empire. Again, Athens was the center of intellectual thought and worldly philosophy. And I say worldly philosophy because the word philosophy, in its true sense, means the love of wisdom and the love of truth. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So true philosophy is godly philosophy. It starts with the understanding, the worldview that God created. But instead, we've veered off course. And we have this godless worldview where we try to find answers inside this box of what we think we know. But Athens was the center of this worldly philosophy. It's where Socrates and Plato and Aristotle hailed from. But they didn't love people, they loved knowledge. And what do we know about knowledge? Knowledge puffs up and love edifies. And you see their arrogance at the end of Acts 17 because Paul was talking about the resurrection of the dead. And what did they do? They mocked him. They made fun of him. And then Paul writes in Romans 1, and I think he's writing about the the Athenians, he writes, professing to be wise, they became fools. So Paul leaves, and he leaves before Silas Silas and Timothy return. He was supposed to wait in Athens for Timothy and Silas, and he decides, hey, you know, What, I'm not going to stick around. So he travels to Corinth, and Corinth was massive, had just under a population of one million people. It was a hotbed for commerce because it commanded the trade routes, both by land and by sea. So money was flowing in and money was flowing out, and it was also known throughout the region for its love of worldly pleasures. If you had a vice of any kind, there was probably someone in Corinth that was willing to feed that vice. That's the type of city it was. The name Corinthian, and I'm sure most of you are familiar with this, it was synonymous with a drunkard. So even if you didn't live in Corinth, maybe you were an Ethiopian, and you went to a party and your buddy got drunk and passed out on the ground, you'd be like, look at that Corinthian. That's... That's how debased that society was. They were obsessed with sensuality. In Greek plays, a Corinthian was often portrayed as someone who was drunk. That was the stereotype. This is where Paul is entering into now. This is where Paul is bringing the gospel to. Now, the center of Corinth 
there was a temple dedicated to the goddess Aphrodite. And every night over a thousand prostitutes would come down from this temple and offer themselves to men as an act of religious worship. And the funds would go back into the the temple. Doesn't that sound like a man-made religion? Hey, this is worship. All you prostitutes, you come down from the temple and you sleep with us men, and we'll call it an act of worship. That's what a man does when he's left to his own desires. While Paul was in Corinth, let me give you a little bit of his mindset, because he wrote the book of Romans while he was staying in in Corinth. And as he looked around at everything that was going on, let me read you his words in Romans 1.28. He says, and even as they did not like to retain God in in their knowledge, even though they didn't give God a second thought, God gave them over to a debased mind to those things which are not fitting, being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful, who knowing the righteous judgment of God that those who practice such things are deserving of death. Not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. That last verse, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do they... They not only do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them. He's saying those that know the, the truth not only approve of this broken lifestyle, but they participate in it knowing its end. This is what Paul wrote about the city in Corinth. And we're going to see Paul enter into Ephesus as well, where there's half a million people It's the religious capital of Rome at the time. See, the thing about the Roman Empire, there's a part of the Roman state called the imperial cult. Have any of you ever heard of that before? The imperial cult. It was was really a, a religion, and just like Pharaoh, the emperors and members of their families were worshiped as gods. That's what we do. When we push God out of our culture, we become gods. Just like Pharaoh, just like the Roman Empire, just like the Mormon faith, where when you die, you get your own planet with many wives. Who would want many wives? But that's what we do. That's what our mind conjures up when we're left to our own desires. So Paul is hitting some huge cities on this leg of his journey, and big cities have unique problems, but they also have very unique opportunities. How many of you know what the biggest city population-wise is in the United States? Take a guess. Michael knows because he's from there. New York City, New York. Number two, probably the worst city in all of the world, Los Angeles, because the Lakers and Dodgers reside there. (laughs) Number three, Chicago. Number four, Houston. Number five, Philadelphia. Pretty big cities, huh? Who's number six? Phoenix. We are the sixth largest city population-wise in the United States. You ever think about that? And God has us here smack in the middle of it. And because of that, we have some very unique problems. We are exposed to the very same things that Paul is seeing in the city of Corinth. And we're not just exposed to it, it lives in our mind. See, ministry in Phoenix looks very different than ministry in Belleville, Pennsylvania. That's where my grandparents and my dad is from. 
It's Amish country. I remember one day I was visiting and I was looking through the newspaper and in the crime section, there was only one article. Someone stole a gas cap from a lawnmower. That was, that was newsworthy there. But in our newspaper, we see murder after murder after murder and it doesn't move us because we're so desensitized to it. Guys, we are in a unique situation, but with unique opportunity. So as we study Paul, as he goes through these big cities, let's continue to learn how to be the church and not simply go to church, but how to be the bride of Christ, how to be his body. Because Acts, it's not a description, it's a what? It's a prescription. It's prescribing to us how we are to be the body of Jesus Christ. Look at Acts chapter 1, verse 11. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontius, who had recently come from Italy. Now, Aquila's a guy, by the way. I don't know if that threw anyone else off, but Aquila's a guy. And you'll learn that because his wife's name is Priscilla. Because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he came to them. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked with them. For by occupation they were all tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and and he he persuaded both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia, Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he departed from there. And he entered the house of a certain man named Justice, who worshiped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Then Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his household, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision, do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent, for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in the city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Paul meets up with a couple of believers in Corinth, Aquila and his wife Priscilla, and they had recently left Italy because Claudius had commanded the Jews to depart. Now an ancient secular Greek historian, he writes about this same event. And he writes this, since the Jews constantly made disturbances at the instigation of Christus, he, the emperor Claudius, expelled them from Rome. Now that Christus, many believe it was actually Christ. So the emperor expelled the Jewish Christians from Rome because they were causing problems. And that would be pretty in line with what's been going on throughout the book of Acts. As the apostles preached Jesus Christ as the Messiah, controversy followed them, violence followed them. So here's Aquila and Priscilla, they get kicked out of Italy because of their faith. And because they were of the same trade as Paul, They were tent makers. Paul connected with them. Now, a rabbi, and Paul was a rabbi at one time, they were required to learn a trade. And so Paul learned the trade of cloth making or leather making or what we translate to be tent making. So he stayed with them and he worked during the week so that he could what? Reason on the weekend. Reason in the synagogue on the weekend. Paul's mission, look at this, guys. Paul's mission wasn't dependent on outside financial support. Paul wasn't dependent on the support of others. He continued whether the finances were there or not. So if he had to go to work to support what God had called him to, he was going to do that. Nothing was going to hinder him 
from carrying the message that Christ had compelled him to carry. See, Paul didn't travel hundreds of miles across Asia and the Roman Empire sharing the truth of the gospel because it paid well. He wasn't a mercenary for Christ. He was a bondservant of Jesus Christ. So the mission that God had called him to was going to be fulfilled regardless of outside circumstance. And that's why Paul is so encouraging to me. He was never limited by his external circumstances. It wasn't limited by money. He wasn't limited by health problems. He wasn't limited by persecution. He wasn't restricted by any time constraints. He adapted to whatever situation he was in because his life was centered around the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now we say, well, that's Paul. That's not us. It needs to be us because that's why we live and breathe for the sake of the gospel. So many of us say, well, I just don't have time. Then reorganize your schedule. If we have time for dancing with the stars, we should have time, Stephen. We should have time (laughs) to share the gospel. I understand there's times in life where it gets really hectic. We have family that are sick. We're sick ourselves and things get busy, I understand that. But if we live in a state of perpetual busyness, we need to take a step back. Because you've heard the saying, if God, if Satan can't make us evil, he'll make us what? Busy. He doesn't want us busy about the Lord's work. Paul was never restricted by external circumstances. Philippians 4.10, what does he write? But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last you care for me, your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. See, Paul was reasoning on the, in the synagogues on the weekend, working during the week, but when Timothy and Silas came, they brought something. They brought something from the church in Philippi that's in Macedonia. They brought a gift so that Paul no longer had to work during the week. He could give himself entirely all week long to preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Paul's writing back to the church in Philippi here in chapter 4, verse 10. He said, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Though you surely always cared, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have, listen to what he says here. He says, thank you for your gift. I didn't really need it, but I appreciate it. But the reason I didn't need it is because I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned to be both full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We kind of leave out those first verses. We like that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can hit that home run. You you see a lot of professional athletes, they love that verse, but the verse The verses before it, it's talking about suffering and suffering lack. Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, whether the finances are there or not, whether I was stoned the previous evening and then got up the next morning and went to the next synagogue and continued to preach the gospel. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well, he tells them, that you shared in my distress. I didn't need the money, but I appreciated it. Now I'll continue to focus all my energy on preaching the gospel in Corinth. See, Paul also says in 1 Corinthians, as he writes to the church that he is planning now in the book of Acts, He says, I've made myself a slave to all that I might win the more. I have become all things to all people so that by all means possible, I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Guys, the gospel is secondary to so many of us. We are distracted by so many other things. And for some of us, it's not even secondary. It's like 10th, or 
20th or it doesn't even make the list. And I'm not talking about simply going on a street corner and, and, and telling people they're going to hell. That's not the gospel. I mean, having the cross in full view all the time in every interaction we have. Loving the lost. Does God's heart break for the lost? See, we, we need to be careful. We live in a pretty broken world, don't we? When he, Paul writes in Romans 12... 1, or in Romans 1, 28, he spends a lot of times in Romans talking about how broken this world is. We need to be careful because if we pray for God's heart, we're going to be broken a lot for this broken world. We're going to become an emotional individual because there is a lot of hurt in this world. But that hurt, when we can have compassion on it, when we can feel the hurt of someone else in our own heart, when we can see their desperate need for Jesus, it changes the way that we love them, and it changes the way that we pray for them. So it's dangerous. You better buckle up if you pray for it, but we desperately need it. We need the heart of God. If not, we're all just going through the motions. Church is just a building. Worship is just a song. Christian is just a title. But when we can say, Lord, I want to live in you and through you, I want to be a part of your plan, I want to be a part of your mission, give me your eyes, give me your heart, get ready, because he will. Paul had this. Paul was broken for the city. He didn't run from them. He didn't just point out all their failings and then hightail it out of there. He stayed and he planted a church. See, guys, we are all missionaries. That's what many people don't understand. I heard a pastor in Honolulu say, a missionary isn't always someone who crosses the sea, but it is always someone who sees the cross. We are all missionaries. That's why we have that little saying above the door, you are entering the mission field. And then we wonder, as we neglect that mission, why our life is without purpose. It's because we're not fulfilling what God has called us to. We are called to be missionaries. Now, some of you, and it's such a blessing to me, some of you have this mindset that Paul had, that you'll work your trade, and your trade is just to support your ministry. That's encouraging. Some of you know very well that your trade, your job, simply supports you sharing the gospel, loving your neighbor, loving others. And you know what I see in those people? They look at Mondays a little bit differently than other people. They don't have that dread. Well, they may have a little bit of dread, but they don't have that, like, the world is ending, it's Sunday afternoon feeling. See, it transforms your work ethic. Paul wasn't fixated on his tent-making job. That was secondary to sharing the love of Christ verbally and physically. Then when Timothy and Silas joined up with Paul, they brought that gift from Philippi, and Paul focused solely on testifying to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. Now again, let me read something to you that Paul wrote back to the church of Corinth after this church was planted. In 2 Corinthians eleven 9, I'll just read it to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one. For what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I continue to keep myself. Now, here's something that's interesting that I don't know if you caught. It wasn't until Silas and Timothy arrived that Paul began preaching that Jesus was the Christ. Did you notice that? When Paul was alone there, he was setting the foundation, but he didn't come out and say that Jesus was the Messiah until... Paul, or until Silas and Timothy showed up. Why? I like what John Corson writes about this. He says, I believe there are two reasons. First, he was emboldened by the presence of his friends. 
don't you find yourself becoming a whole lot bolder when standing by a fellow believer? That's why Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. It's wonderful to minister with another brother or sister. Second, he was emboldened by the pressure in his heart. He knew he had held back long enough and that he had to share Jesus or like a volcano erupt. Paul says, I'm compelled to share Christ. See, this would coincide with what the Lord would later tell Paul. Now, what is, look at verse 10 there. Verse 10 in Acts chapter 18. It would seem that Paul held back a little bit until Silas and Timothy got there. And the reason why, I think, is kind of clear, because look at what Jesus says to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak. And do not keep silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in this city. Do not be afraid. I am with you. Now, Jesus usually doesn't tell us to not be afraid unless we're what? Afraid. You're a deep thinker, I can tell. Jesus wouldn't tell Paul, hey, don't be afraid, if Paul wasn't afraid. So what was Paul afraid of? What did Paul fear? Paul consistently says throughout his epistles, I will not fear what man can do to me. But I don't think that's something that he was born with. I think it was something that he arrived at, that the Lord had to work out in him. See, Paul's starting to see a trend. Wherever he goes and he preaches the gospel and people come to Christ and they get saved, what happens next? Conflict. Usually violent conflict. Paul's noticing a pattern here. And so now here he is in Corinth, which is really hell on earth in some sense. As godless of a culture as you could probably get. And he's going toe-to-toe with the kingdom of man. And he knows, he knows that the gospel undermines everything the kingdom of man stands for. What is the kingdom of man? The kingdom of man is a kingdom in which I am my own God. I am in control. And if I feel like I'm losing control, I'm going to fight to remain in control. That's the kingdom of man. It's where I'm ruled by my wants and my needs, and I invest all of my times in all of my time in things that are temporary, and things that are fleeting, and things that are dying, and things that are fading. And I run around chasing that next new thing that will give me some type of satisfaction, and then when it's gone, I'm left to find something else. That's the kingdom of man where my energy is spent pursuing intellectual, physical, and spiritual pleasure. It's about me and what I can get out of it. And the gospel undermines all of this, and that's what Paul is preaching. Paul's message tells us that we're not our own, that we've been bought with a price. The gospel tells me I'm no longer ruled by my flesh. I'm ruled by the Spirit of God, and I'm empowered by His Spirit to meet the needs of others for the sake of Christ. Through the gospel, I get to invest my time in things that are what? Eternal and everlasting and full of purpose. My energy is spent pursuing Jesus Christ. See, those two worlds can't coexist. Paul's message is poison to the flesh. Paul's message is a consuming fire to the self-centered, worldly mind. And many times people will say, yes, please, I need that. I'm so sick of my flesh. I'm so sick of that self-centered mentality. Lord, have your work. Burn that away. But a lot of times... That message is met with kicking and screaming. 
because our flesh despises it. Romans 8, 5 through 9, for those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. The mind that is set on the flesh is at war with God. Really, we wanna be at war with God? Who do we think we are? For it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If, in fact, the Spirit of God dwells in you, anyone who does not have the Spirit of Christ does not belong to Him. How does that message sound to you this morning? Some of you, it'll be refreshing. Yes, Lord, burn it away. Take away everything that's not of you. I'm tired of hurting the people that I love. I'm tired of not caring about the people that are dying without you. I'm tired of waking up in the morning and just constantly thinking of myself. Lord, I need your refining fire. But some will say, shut up. I don't want to hear that. I'm sick of all this church stuff. I'm sick of all this religion. Guys, it's not about religion. It's about whether Jesus Christ is who he says he is. 2 Corinthians 2.15, For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one, we are the aroma of death leading to death, and to the other, the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? If you live out the gospel, you will smell like garbage to some. They'll want to get you away from them, and to the others, you will be the sweet smell of life but you're gonna get both reactions if you're living out the gospel. In in the middle of our current, in the middle of Phoenix, Arizona, in the middle of just this neighborhood where every night hundreds of prostitutes come out of their apartments or off of the street and walk up and down 27th Avenue, here, Will we live out the gospel? Will we reach out to them? Will we reach out to these kids living in broken homes who have no father at home? Maybe they have no mother at home. We have kids in our daycare who are getting passed around like a used pair of shoes. And they're constantly being told the lie, not audibly, but by the way their lives are progressing, that you don't matter. Your parents didn't even want you. Your aunt and uncle are looking at any excuse they can to get rid of you. Who's going to tell them that they matter? Do your neighbors know that they matter to God? Do you know the names of your neighbors? I was so convicted the other day. I've been living next to my neighbor for a year. And finally, he was outside. And I may have shared this with you already. And I noticed he had a a Jesus fish on the the back of his car, so I thought I'd have fun with him. I'm like, are you one of those Christians? And he said, yeah, I am. I said, awesome, so am I. (laughs) And he goes to a Calvary down the road. And finally, two Christians living next door to each other for a year get to meet and say hello. I don't know that that's how it was supposed to be. We live in the middle of Corinth. We have incredible opportunities. It will be a struggle. It will be a fight. There will be opposition. But our encouragement 
is the same. Do not be afraid. Do not be overwhelmed, for I am with you. A lot of times we think, what difference can we make? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How much time do we got left, guys? Honestly, as we grow older, how much time do we really think we have left? 